Welcome to Council Connection. I'm Kate Burke, Spokane City Council Member from District 1. Early learning and child care are issues I'm extremely passionate about. To start working on this video, I pulled together a team of local leaders in the field of early education. It soon became clear that there are many voices in the community that need to be heard. From child care providers, business owners, parents, and city leaders, everyone has a story. I set out to interview these folks and share their stories. Within these varied conversations, we discuss the importance of childcare, its impact on business and our economy, what quality childcare means for families, and solutions that we can achieve. With that being said, let's jump in. And thank you for joining me today, Nadine Woodworth, Mayor of the City of Spokane. Um, today, I'm going to ask you a few questions about early learning and child care, and we'd love your perspective. Absolutely. Happy to be here, Kate. Thank you. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to ask you is, obviously, we're going through a pandemic right now, and there is um, a lot of struggle with families and community members in, in the city who uh, struggling time. And I just wondered if you'd like to give us your perspective yeah. on why early learning and childcare is so important and crucial during this time. And then um and we'll go we'll go into to what what we've done to solve this problem. Sure. Um when the COVID crisis began, um uh, seems like years ago, but uh earlier this year we knew that uh childcare and uh, educational support was going to be extremely important. And so uh, when the Emergency Operations Center was stood up early in our COVID response, we identified child care as a priority and even formed a child care work group so that we could assess the needs of families. And early on, the needs were for healthcare workers, first responders, and essential workers. And the daycares were closed and we didn't know what we were gonna do to support them so that they could continue their work on the front lines of COVID. And so um, the school district was extremely um, helpful in that area, but we worked alongside them in our work group to provide the PPE, the personal protective equipment, the sanitation, and meet any needs that they needed uh, to be able to provide that child care. As things started to reopen, we still knew that there were a lot of families that were having to make a choice of either staying home because school was not in session or their child care center wasn't uh, fully operating or go to work. And that's a really challenging decision for our families to have to make. So thankfully, uh, as we got further into COVID, the city of Spokane received nearly $10 million in CARES funding that came from initially from the federal government. We got the state allotment from the state of Washington and we decided really quickly we wanted to get that money out in the community as soon as we could. Mm -hmm. And again, identifying child care and educational support as, as a priority. So let me just, I'd, I'd be happy to share with you how we spent that money. We dedicated a million and a half dollars uh, initially to that. So $450,000 in grants went to uh, community minded enterprises. And that was for licensed child care centers and also tuition. You know, Kate, our neighborhood community centers provide a, an incredible resource for child care and educational support. So we funded community centers more than $300,000 to help with that. The Northeast Youth Center, which is in your district, I got to go visit them and see how the money was being deployed there. And they were fully operational as a child care before, and even the young kids went back to school with laptops and staff and tutors and it was phenomenal to see firsthand the money put to use there. And then a quarter of a million dollars went to Spokane Public Schools for tuition and scholarships because they were able to expand their express program, which typically is an after school program. But it was a full day uh, event when school uh, was not in session or in person school wasn't uh, in session yet. And then the YMCA, they were able to expand child care. That's a that's a big uh, role that they provide in the community. And we gave them a quarter of a million dollars. And then finally, a half a million dollars went to some other agencies like Catholic Charities and Women Helping Women, all to support childcare. 
Wow, that's amazing. I love hearing about that. And you're so right. This is such an essential part of our infrastructure here in the city. Um, but I just wondered if you could share a little bit about why this was so important for you to uh, to fund, you know, early learning and child care. Why was this such a priority for you as, as the mayor of the city of Spokane? Sure. You know, I think there's a real concern, um, especially in the early childhood, uh, childhood learning, that a lot of our children, because of COVID, are falling through the cracks, and especially children of low-income families who don't have laptops for online learning or even the Wi-Fi um, in order to support that type of learning. And parents who just can't dedicate uh, an entire day if they're working, how are they going to help their kids with, with early learning? And so the fact that we could support those different organizations and agencies within our community that are dedicated to that, to help in that area was, was really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel the same way. I think this is such a crucial time. And what I've really seen is it's not even just that it's a crucial time because of COVID. It's that it's really shown 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 a light on this this issue that we're having around early learning and childcare and how essential it really is to the growth of our city, to the infrastructure and economy of our city. So we have to give uh, children uh, all the help and support to make them uh, successful in school and and whatever they decide to do after school uh, as they become young adults and into the world, the workplace and, and all of that. So if we can start younger, um, that's always the, the, the best practice as, as we've come to learn. Yes, I love that. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And um, we hope that we can uh, work on this issue together in the future. And um, thank you for investing so much money to this dire um, infrastructure need in our community. It's our future, right? Children are our future. So that's that's where the priority needs to be. And Kate, it was great to join you today. Thank you. Thank you. are grateful to have Becky join us and Becky why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do at Spokane Public Schools. Yeah I'd be happy to. Uh, my name is Becky Ramsey and I am currently the special ed director for Spokane Public Schools. I'm also the lead for early learning um, and so support for our ECAP programs and our developmental preschool programs. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to ask you a few questions about early learning and child care and why it's important. Uh, so uh, the first question I have uh, today is why is early learning important to um, school age instructors? Well, it's incredibly important to school age instructors, whether they consciously realize it or not. Uh, so, you know, the research is clear that early learning uh, students that have had a quality early learning experience uh, they have, they just have such an advantage. Um, they have higher graduation rates. They have uh, higher um, uh, social emotional quotients, uh, less retention rates, and less referrals for special education. So, um, all all instructors, whether they know it or not, are are have the benefits when a student has a rigorous early learning program. Our kindergarten teachers, though, are the front line. They're they're the ones that that see both the um, the positives of a great early learning program when kids come into kindergarten. And then, of course, they're the first to see that um, we do in our area need um, additional supports uh, to support our youngest learners. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Uh, speaking about that, um, what hurdles uh, does Spokane Public Schools have because our, our child care early learning system is so broken? Yeah. Well, our system is definitely complex. So we have, um, you know, early learning is not mandated uh, in the state of Washington. And so that's left separate entities to pick up um, the need. So you have everything from tuition-based uh, centers and, and preschool programs uh, for those who have the ability to afford it, all the way to um, it, our, our, our state pay programs like Head Start and ECAP. And we, in our area just don't have enough slots um, to serve all our kids. 
Um, and recently, OSPI and uh, DCYF have been partnering on how to bridge the gap and between uh, K-12 systems and early learning systems through the governor's uh, uh, guidance. And so we're seeing some additional funding streams coming in. Um, Transitional Kindergarten, for example, is a new program within the state. Um, but really the biggest hurdle is the complexity of the funding and how, how you manage the, all the funding streams to support programming while also keeping our K-12 system strong. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for sharing all that information. It's a lot of good facts and figures for us. So uh, my next question is, uh, what gaps have you seen in, what, what gaps have you found in our system in terms of special education and then the transition from early learning to special education? Um, the one of the biggest gaps right now that exists in our area, I'm back to the access for um, for all students for early learning is um, we do know so students um, with disabilities are we as a school district are required to provide services for them. And again, we need their general education peers um, in the classroom with them also. So the biggest gap is that funding for a pre-K model that serves all kids. So, cause we know that inclusive environment is the best way to serve all of our students. And then having those full day options. So the half day options for um, families are great um, for those that have flexible schedules and, and prefer that half day for their, their young child. Um, but for our working families, a full day option is, is definitely a gap that we have right now. And we're going to be, um, we have an early learning task force that I'm putting together. We're going to meet in January. So kind of all the models that are out there for early learning in schools we'll be taking a look at and expanding to a, having some full day options is definitely something we'll be looking at. Oh, that sounds amazing. I love all the work around this that you yeah. guys are doing. Um, so you've kind of touched on a lot of this, but uh, what, you know, why just generally, why is early learning such a priority for you? Um, well, you know, our, you know, last year, our kindergarten readiness scores, our WAKIDS data came out and it was pretty shocking. Um, so the state average was around 47%, which is shocking too. That's not, you know, where definitely we want our kids to be, but Spokane was significantly lower at 25%. So um, looking at different models, again, around the state and districts that have robust, robust early learning programs and how um, can we bring something like that that will boost those readiness scores for our kids? So just seeing our kindergartners coming in less and less ready for kindergarten um, has really um, made this a priority. You know, if they, they're coming in, you know, really behind in letter identification and just cooperative play skills and even, even toileting and all of those things are covered in a quality early learning program. And then they'll be able to come into kindergarten ready to go instead of trying to make up preschool skills. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And you're right. That is such a shocking statistic that we found. And, and that's why I, I make early learning such a priority and think this would step in and do some more work there. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. So if you could change one or solve one problem in our early learning system, what would it be? And mm -hmm. I think the dream is that state funded early learning for all um, for the, you know, just like the state made full day kindergarten a priority for all. Uh, I think that next step is um, a fully state funded pre K program. So any student who wants to access and any family that wants to access uh, preschool can in our state. Yeah, that's a good point. So I've heard a stat that only 1% of the state's educational budget goes to early learning. And mm -hmm. if we could maybe even just up that a little bit, uh, I think we can make a huge dent in our system. So yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you have a good rest of your week. Yep, you too. Thank you for, for having me.
we have Lee Williams joining us from Community Minded Enterprises. So Lee, why don't you tell us a little bit about Community Minded Enterprises and what they do um, when it comes to early learning? Is an organization that serves the community here in Spokane in early learning recovery and, and also helping people with disabilities to access their benefits. Um, in early learning, we have many different programs. Our primary program is called Early Achievers, and it's the state's quality improvement rating system. Uh, we provide coaching, professional development, so that child care programs can increase the quality of what they're doing and be supported by a coach in being able to do that. We also provide uh, what we call a support program for family, friends, and neighbors. It's Play and Learn Kaleidoscope. Uh, we've been doing that uh, in the community, but also most especially in the community of recovery to help parents who are coming out of recovery to reconnect with their children and um, learn how to parent in sobriety. Um, and then we also subcontract with the Community Colleges of Spokane to do a pre-K program called ECAP. Um, and that serves three and four year olds. We have two locations, one on the south side up on 55th for it's a six hour full day program and one on division at well, the two, 2000 block at division and Shannon, which provides half day. So morning and afternoon uh, pre pre K program um, and those are those are essentially our early learning um, programs that we have. We contract with. Uh, Child Care Aware of Washington to provide those, and the funding comes from the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Wow, that's a lot and very extraordinary. So um, we're thankful to have you in our community. So, um, my next question is, why do you feel, why has early learning been such a priority for you? Well, it's been a priority for me because uh, when I gave birth to my first child, I had this thirst for really wanting to know how to raise her in appropriately. So first I'm an educator. So it's when I got involved with my daughter's development, I quickly took that and transferred it over to getting a degree. So I have a teaching degree and I did teach um, for a while. And then when I discovered that the community had a lot to do with how to improve early childhood education, I decided it was really important not only to be an educator, which is, of course, a really important job, and also to be an advocate for all children to make sure that no matter where they were in life, whether they were privileged, whether they were not, whether they were um, suffering family violence or poverty or had parents who were struggling with addiction, that they should all have um, an equal uh, road in early education. So those those were the compelling reasons why I got involved. In uh, so Lee, why do you think that the city of Spokane should be investing in early learning? Well, I think the city of Spokane should be invested in early learning for really two primary reasons. The first one is it nurtures and educates the child from the time they're an infant. Um, and until they get in our education system. So brain growth is at its maximum between birth to age three. So at that time, those neurons are connecting and brain growth is happening, which happens because we have a quality stimulating environment, whether it be from the family, of course, or from the childcare program that's providing care for the family when they have to go off to work or school or attend um, something that helps the family to grow and sustain itself. And secondly, it's good for the economy. Um, the, the return on investment for early learning is at 13%, according to Heckman, who did the Heckman curve, showing that when we invest in early learning, we're investing in the future. So if we want capable citizens that are happy and participating in the wonderful economy and life we have here in Spokane, then uh, we want that kind of return on investment. And I think that investment could be even greater if we were to also invest in compensating uh, early learning teachers so that they could have a better quality of life and a more secure job and uh, 
salary and impact for their families. Yeah, all of that makes so much sense to me. So thank you for sharing some of those facts. Um, sure. another, the, another question I wanted to ask, you kind of talked a little bit about it, but what are some of the gaps that you're seeing in early learn in our early learning system? Well, there, well, first of all, it's not adequately funded. I mean, that's really the main gap. Um, parents um, don't have the ability to pay what they need to pay to really get high quality care. We ask parents to pay what is uh, sometimes really equal to a college education. Um, year by year as their child is growing up at the time when they're probably least able to do that. And there's not really good financial assistance for families during that time. So they aren't able to pay childcare programs very much money. Childcare programs lack the revenue then, and then they do not have the ability to be able to provide the learning and play materials to hire the staff that they need to hire in order to really make it a high quality program. And then I have found that most people want to make childcare a, a fairly easy conversation when in fact it's a very complex conversation. Um, solutions are are really quite complex and all we've done really to date is kind of throw band-aids on it and say, well, we'll fix this part, we'll fix that part, but really we need to be looking at the whole system so that we can do that. And then, as I said, inadequate compensation for teachers. If we expect teachers to teach children at a time when their brain development is at its maximum and we're paying them so little to do that, then we're not really supporting what we need to be supporting for, for children to really grow and enter into our education system and into life ready to tackle it. And then understanding that childcare is an economic support to get people back to work, especially of course now when we're all wanting to have economic recovery from COVID, we really do have to provide childcare in a capacity that's going to help people that are out there looking for childcare. Otherwise, they will not be able to return to work or worse, they may put their children into situations which are not safe, um, uh, resulting in injury to children, resulting in lack of uh, growing and nurturing, and sometimes even resulting in, in worse things than that. So we don't want that to happen. We wanna provide um, a safe quality experience for children. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with all of those issues. I, you know, we really need to start focusing on our system. It's clearly not not working and uh, it should be a very big priority. So my last question for you today is, uh, so you mentioned a lot of the gaps that we're seeing in our early mm -hmm. learning system. If you could just fix one of the problems, solve one of the problems that you see out there, where would you put your focus? Well, that's a tough question, as you know, because there's so many problems and they're so complex. But as I thought about this, I thought, really, what we need to do is to have everybody understand why it's important to invest in early learning. Unless we have that understanding, we are not going to make any forward movement in early learning that's going to result in, in solving some of these complex problems that we have. I rarely enter into a conversation in this community where childcare does not come up. Um, whether I be talking to people in recovery or in the disability world or people who are serving people with low income housing, um, we're working um, on reducing family violence. Childcare is always at the core of that. So unless that's understood, unless the community can really understand that, then I, I, I think it's the core of being able to move forward at that point so that we have adequate funding. We seem to have bursts of funding that come from different places um, and yet no sustainable way to really keep the system operating and moving forward. So I think if the community were to know that this is, this is a very complex problem that they would support it. And that would also be true of um, our city government um, we have 
really made great, we have made some good strides recently in having city government really be involved in childcare through um, uh, investing in CARES money that went out to families and also went out to childcare, which was great, but we need to be doing that on an ongoing basis in a sustainable way if we really wanna make a change. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us and your perspectives and a little bit more about what Community Minded Enterprises does around early learning. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for giving voice to a really important issue, Kate. And thank you for being such a great advocate in early learning. We really appreciate what you're doing and also what the city's doing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, today we have Colleen joining us and she is an owner, a business owner of a local early learning center. So Colleen, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, um, I'm Colleen Condon, uh, born and raised in Spokane. I own Lilac City Early Learning Center on the north side. Um, and yeah, I, I run the day-to-day -day operations and, and act as the director. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my first question is, uh, you know, you own a business, you own an early learning facility. Like, why have you made early learning such a priority in your life? Um, early learning is is my passion. It's it's what I love to do, um, and it's it's so foundational to everything. And as I learn and grow in my role and my career, um, it just continues to cement that for me. That's awesome. Uh, so. I have another question about um, your facility and uh, how do you think your facility and having high quality early learning for our young ones can help um, the future teachers down the road? Absolutely. Um, I think there's a huge uh, disconnect and, and misunderstanding about the importance of early learning. Um, early learning really is that foundation that allows our children to be prepared when they walk into a kindergarten classroom and, and through their entire career in the K-12 system. Um, there's so much social and emotional development that needs to happen with children before they are put in into a classroom and expected to learn and really at the end of the day i think that we we fail our k-12 system in in not having the children prepared and ready to go into the classroom and ultimately we're failing the families and the children most because um no child should walk into a classroom unprepared for for their learning and and everything that needs to happen there and i think that you know Early learning has always been looked at as kind of a, a glorified babysitting situation when really we know with the science and, and everything that there's so much more at play and there's so much development happening and really missing the opportunity to set children up for success at earlier ages is, is a huge failure. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, so speaking on that, you you mentioned some um, some gaps in the system and and how uh, and how the systems kind of have uh, failed our our uh, families. What would you say is the biggest gap when it comes to early learning? I I think the biggest gap is. Um, is supporting our early learning workforce. Um, we need high quality educators that are paid wages that allow them to pursue higher education, um, other various trainings through the community and things like that to really develop and hone in on their skills. And we know that the longer a caretaker, whether that's you know an early learning teacher or a, a family home provider, or even um, our family friends and neighbors system that we have here in Washington, the longer that that caretaker or educator is with that child and develops those relationships, the, the more capable they're going to be of um, really setting that child up for success and really meeting those social emotional needs for the children. And we fail our teachers, especially in a, in a center setting, um, 
all the time because we are not paying them adequate wages to um, allow them to go to school, allow them to make a living wage that really um, lets them, you know, work on their skills and, and develop this as a career. We have a lot of people that are passionate and they leave the field because they aren't able to provide for their own families. And that's a, a huge problem and it's a huge hurdle. I mean, I know um, how heartbroken families in my own center are when a teacher moves on to um, something different and, and how much of an impact that has on not only the classroom, um, but the center as a whole. And I really think that we need to better support those teachers so that we are able to maintain that quality. Um, they're the biggest factor when it comes to a quality um, early learning environment. Well, that's a great point. I've heard a lot of um, centers having trouble keeping employees uh, there and that that consistency is so important for our young ones. So, uh, so OK, we'll move on to the next question. And um, I'm just wondering um, if you could just solve one problem in early learning, uh, what would it be and why? Um, I think the one problem that I would want to solve is is access. Um, so kind of in a twofold part there, um, access in that we start to treat early learning like the infrastructure that it is for our community and ultimately our economy. Uh, we need to have uh, high quality early learning centers. Um, home providers, FFN providers, we need to have enough of those that all of the children who need to be in, in those settings are able to, as well as all the families who want their children to be able to participate. And the other side of that is, is families being able to afford that. So not only having that, that access to all of those um, settings, but also being able to afford it. And we know um, that there's, there's a huge gap there in, in the affordability. Yes. Well, thank you so much. I've learned so much and I know our viewers probably feel the same way. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us today and I hope you have a good rest of your week. Hello and thank you for joining us today, Tara. Um, so I first wanted to start out by asking just a little bit about yourself and who you are and um, yeah, just share some of your story with us. Yeah, so um, I'm a social worker. I work for Transitions, um, specifically at the Transitional Living Center. Um, I've been here for about going on six years. So our facility serves um, women with children who are in a transitional housing status. So um, most of them are fleeing domestic violence or working with CPS and have just been reunified with their children. Um, and so it's a, a very a high needs population, but a really rewarding population to work with. I love my job. Um, other than that, I have, I have two kids, um, eight and three, both boys. Um, I'm the only girl in my house, so I'm quite outnumbered. Um, and yeah, that's that's about it. Awesome. Well, uh, could you tell us just a little bit about what childcare looks like for you and um, and your kiddos? Yeah. So um, my younger one, my three year old, is full time um, at a, a center down the road, um, and we were lucky enough to. Um, I was referred there by a coworker whose daughter works there. So I had an in, so I kind of felt more comfortable with it. Otherwise, I don't think I ever would have pursued a center. Um, and then my, my eight-year-old is in second grade. And prior to the pandemic, he would go to express the child care at the school after school. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, that, you know, obviously stopped right away. Um, and so then it's been a, a very big juggling act and balancing of, of how to uh, provide child care for an eight-year-old who is not quite old enough to come to work with me and self-manage, um, but is too old to go to his brother's daycare where there's nap time and, you know, uh, toddler toys and that kind of thing. Um, and is definitely not quite old enough to stay home alone yet. Yeah, that's a lot of movies. Um, right. And it's a lot of instability for him at an age where he needs stability and reliability. Yeah, absolutely. So can you kind of walk us through um, a little bit about um, 
some more of those barriers that you saw during the pandemic, but then also some of um, what have you done um, to find the solution for that? Yeah, so, I mean, the barriers with the pandemic were, were really everything shut down, um, especially for that, that school age population. And so my husband and I are both um, considered essential workers. Um, and so even though the schools and, and the daycares and the businesses shut down, our workload not, I, I would say it increased because our, the clients that we serve increased, um, their needs increased. So there was suddenly a greater demand on our time employment wise, but less options for childcare. Um, and so what we, we, we tried a, a few different options. I was able to, um, in the beginning, somewhat work for home, work from home. Um, but as a, a social worker in a residential setting, I don't know, I tell you, I didn't get much work done from home. Um, I got caught up on my paperwork, so that was great. Uh, but really, the heart of my job is is being here and responding to client needs um, in a socially distant manner. Um, and so in the beginning, I worked from home. My husband isn't really able to work from home because he's an IT um, professional, so he has to go out to job sites. Um, so he ended up taking all of his sick time, his allotted sick time, um, to stay home with our older son. Um, and then over the summer, we enrolled him in like the summer um, express through the school. Um, and that was great. It was, it was great because it was reliable, but it was very expensive very expensive on top of the the full-time tuition already paying for our three-year-old which is about nine hundred dollars a month then we were paying six hundred dollars a month for for our older son um and then that ended at the end of the summer and there wasn't an option to keep going and so um thankfully as of like mid-december he's back in school now um so that takes care of the first you know five hours of the day and then um, he either has to come to work with me and we just try to manage that or um, or I go home early or, you know, just whatever we can do. The other challenge hurdle is that with the pandemic, we would normally rely on family members. So like my mother or my aunt or something, but because they're in that that um, vulnerable population, we I don't want them coming to my house where I'm still going to work. My son's still going to school. So oh, that it's it's really been a challenge, um, and we're we're still doing it day by day. Well, yeah, that's a lot of a lot of things, a lot of moving pieces again, and just um, yeah, I I don't know how we're managing during this. It's it sounds really stressful. So yeah. Um, okay, so did you receive some care funding from uh, the grants that we got from uh, for for COVID relief? I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, I received three months of my, my younger son's full tuition. So um, it came out to about um, $2,500 total. And they paid that directly to his daycare. It was it was amazing. Wow. And so that definitely helped you and your family be able to have some of that stability. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, my husband had already depleted all of his sick time. And so now knowing that those three months are covered, if something comes up and he has to take a day without pay to be home with our our other son, it's not quite so, um, the consequences aren't quite so big. We don't have to think about like, oh, well, what does that mean in terms of like dollar amount? And are we gonna be able to pay rent this month? And yeah, it, it definitely provided a huge security blanket for us. Yeah, that's great. I'm really happy that you guys were able to get that assistance and you know we're able to give out a lot of funding at the city and we prioritized early learning and uh, that was really great for our community. Um, it was really great on my end to see um, funding that was prioritized towards families that didn't qualify for working connections because that's the one of the another big challenge I have I've had forever is that I don't qualify and so I'm in this you know this weird middle lane where you you make too much to not qualify but yeah yeah absolutely um so as a social worker who works in you know transitions with women vulnerable women and uh they have an early learning facility and then mm -hmm. also as a mom who's seen some of the issues with with early learning what are some of the gaps that you um that you found in early learning and child care <laughs> definitely 
I think it, I'm in a unique position because I see it on both sides. So as someone who doesn't qualify for the assistance, um, the cost is such a challenge. You know, um, we're relatively lucky to only pay 900. I have coworkers who pay 1500 a month in childcare. Um, and so for us, it's, it's finding, finding somewhere that we feel safe dropping our son off at but we can still afford. But then on the other hand, for my clients who do qualify for working connections, um, it's they they have to struggle to find a daycare that will accept them because of that funding source. Um, and so it's, it, yeah, it, it's a double-edged sword no matter what you do. Um, and, and a lot of my families here, um, and, and I, I think there's a correlation between like if you qualify for working connections, like, you have less resources, maybe they don't have transportation. Um, and so then we're, we're putting parents in a position where they have to, the only daycare op open to them is across town. So then they have to get up with their kids on a bus, go across town. Um, it's, it's just sad to see the barriers that are there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I've just found that there's just so many gaps and barriers for families uh, trying to make it by, uh, it's, um, we have a lot of work to do. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, if you could, uh, just solve one problem in our early education system, what would it be? I, I think it would be again, touching on that, the availability of daycares for families with working connections. Um, and, and, you know, so if I had a magic wand and I could solve it and, and not worry about the implications of this, um, I I imagine something where each licensed daycare would would be mandated to take a certain percentage of um, working connections children. Um, but again, I don't know what the implications of that are. Um, but as a client advocate, that's kind of the solution that I see happening. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think the the reason folks don't do that is because the reimbursement fund mm -hmm. that the facility gets for each child that's in working connections mm -hmm. is not enough to actually pay their employees good enough. I know. And so um, that's what, you know, we really need to work on reimbursement rates mm -hmm. and um, how we see our child care providers, do we see it as a career or is it, you know, seen as glorified babysitting and how do we kind of change that narrative mm -hmm. and things like that? So, right, exactly. Because I don't think the problem is at all with child care providers. Every single one I've ever worked with, with both my children are amazing and they, I could never do what they do, you know, um, but absolutely it's, it's the pay rate. It's, especially with the smaller like in-home ones um they can't afford to take working connections child care because they end up losing more money than they would bring in and so i it, absolutely i understand it um yeah. yeah well awesome i just wanted to thank you for joining us today and sharing your afternoon and uh and and your story with us so um to to see you again soon Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Well, hello there and welcome and thanks for joining me today. Uh, I would love for you guys to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the Salish School and how Early Learning is incorporated with it. Why Jais Quistin is Sitak Puchkin Il Mikum Gulls Captain Suck Jeans in Mat Mayatin? Hi, I'm Larray Wiley and I'm the executive director of Sailor School Spokane. Oh, in Sakwa Kuum so atten, oh, in Sakin Hatus, a la Kos Kat in Suck Jeans in Mat Mayatin. My name is Chris Parkin and I am the principal here at Sailor School Spokane. And, um, we first got our start, Salish School Spokane is celebrating its 10th year in operation this year. And um, when we first started off, we recognized that um, children are wonderful learners of language and that they would be a, a great vehicle to um, carry our language through the generations and connect parents with language. So that was our 
our focus in the beginning and we've just followed those children up through the grades so that now we serve up through 12th grade um and i'll have chris talk to some of the details yeah i mean right now we serve uh 68 students and that's from one year old and we have one senior in high school who's doing running starts for Spokane Falls Community College. So uh, in terms of our work, you know, Salish is just a highly, highly endangered language. It's the first language of Spokane. And it's endangered because of the history of genocide and repression and Jim Crow that has taken place all around our area and in Spokane. Um, and so our school is a grassroots effort. Does, uh, that's mandate is to preserve that language, bring it back, uh, to restart intergenerational transmission of language and culture. Um, and so we have a very big adult language training program. We have 31 adults who are learning Salish and a good share of those have children enrolled in our school. So the, you know, what we need is investment in communities that have been marginalized and pressured through the years. Uh, and one of the greatest investments we can make is in early childhood education. When kids have really strong bonds with their parents, when Native American kids have a really strong sense of their identity and culture, along with their parents and grandparents, uh, it can really make a huge difference in, in all of their outcomes, uh, academic achievement and earnings and happiness and uh, just their physical and mental well-being. Uh, so we really look at early childhood education, really strong early childhood education with a big investment uh, for our kids is going to make a big difference to our community. And it'll ultimately, uh, a healthy, vital Native American community in Spokane is what will help bring back the first language of Spokane, Salish. So uh, we just know that investing in early childhood education, it has, it, there's everything right about it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you guys have your work cut out for you. Not only are you trying to salvage this language that was decimated, but you're also working with young kids and trying to invest in their learning. So that's amazing. I'm so glad you're a part of our community. Um, um, so, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a minute and say Spokane is a, a very unique place. So we are the only full time Native American immersion school that's located off reservation in an urban area in the lower 48. So in the continental United States, um, Spokane, the city of Spokane and the folks here who donate and support our operations, uh, it's a very unique and special thing that Spokane should be very proud of. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so where do you guys see some of the bigger gaps in early learning when it comes to some of the, the young people that you work with? Um, I think one of the things that, that we often see is that um, some of our students come with um, Deficit. deficits or uh, disadvantages. And so to bring, the, to bring them up to, um, to be kindergarten ready um, and ready to move on in their education, I think that is the biggest thing that we see, that they're coming from a place of disadvantage and so what we try and do is really give them all the advantages that we can as far as like social emotional growth and their academic growth we have very small class sizes and so that really helps us to focus in and help and support the student and their family so at sales school of spokane um but we have a an ecap program and a pilot early ecap program mm -hmm. uh we're the only ecap in the state that uses a native american language as the language of instruction um but you know there's a certain amount of funding that comes along with that and allows a certain kind of student teacher ratio so the ratio in ecap is 10 to 1. Uh, but we write grants and we beg borrow and steal so that we can run a five to one student teacher ratio. And we have excellent outcomes, uh, but it takes that extra investment. And without the investment, we can't change the outcome. So right now across the country and certainly in Spokane, if you wanna find out uh, how well a student's going to do in school and if they're gonna go to college, the number one indicator of that is their family's income. Um, and that hasn't moved ever. 
Um, and what it takes to move that, to actually change outcomes for all students so that every student has a chance is investment, right? Uh, so we're very fortunate to have been supported by this community and uh, all kinds of folks so that we're able to make that investment. So then our kids who are 75% low income, 10 to 15% foster kids, they're having the same outcomes as upper middle class, high income families children are. And it's just a simple question of investment and community building, right? We, if we know if we build it, we will be successful. If we put in place the investment, the outcomes follow. Yeah, it sounds like you guys have it all set up and it's um, exciting that you're investing in this population and um, educating folks around this language and things like that. So again, just so grateful that you're in our community and uh, thank you for sharing all of your educational knowledge with us and uh, we'd love to, to partner soon. So uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Bye, Lee Louise. Rainbow. I hope you are as energized as I am after listening to those stories. I just wanted to express how grateful I am to everyone who took the time to speak with me and share their stories about what they're doing in the community. Your voice matters. I also wanted to extend my gratitude to everyone who supports the effort to bring affordable, quality childcare to Spokane. When young children spend time in early learning classrooms, it prepares them for success in kindergarten and beyond. And when parents and caretakers have access to quality childcare, they can help create a strong workforce and build our economy. Everybody in our community benefits from prioritizing and ensuring early learning and childcare is accessible and affordable for all. Here are some resources and ways you can get involved.